on World News Tonight. Political uproar. Brazil is bracing for more anti-government protests as Lula orders a crackdown. Escalating violence. The number of injured now in the hundreds in Peru as protesters demand President Dina to step down. Probe launched. Attorney General calls a special counsel on Biden's classified document investigation after a third discovery. And Kite Festival. India hosts vibrant international kite festivals after a two-year coronavirus lull. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. Leading tonight are deadly protests raging across Brazil and Peru. We first look at Brazil as the nation is preparing itself for more anti-government mass protests as President Lula bolsters security forces across the capital and country. Over 1,200 people have been charged as Brazilian authorities continue to investigate the riots that took place last Sunday where key government offices were stormed by supporters of Lula's predecessor, Jair Bolsonaro. His administration may be just over a week old, but Brazil's President Lula is bracing for further anti-government protests. Meeting with the country's lawmakers on Wednesday, he called for a crackdown on anyone involved. I wouldn't like to think that what happened here was an attempted coup. I want to believe it was a group of crazy people who still don't understand that the election is over. Any gesture that contradicts or is against Brazil's democracy will be punished within the limits of the law. The concerns have prompted security measures to be ramped up in the capital after the Senate approved military forces to intervene if necessary. Over 1,200 pro-Bolsonaro supporters have been formally arrested and charged in connection to the riots that stormed Brazil's highest offices of power as they called for an overturning of last October's election results. The country's Supreme Court justice has echoed the president's calls for punishment. I'm absolutely sure that the institutions will punish all those responsible, all those who carried out the acts, those who planned the acts, those who financed the acts and those who encouraged them by action or omission, because democracy will prevail. Authorities continue to investigate the mass protests as questions remain around those who may have worked in coordination with the rioters. Meanwhile, the protest in Peru also kept on intensifying and Peru's attorney general has launched a genocide investigation against the country's current president for killing off at least 50 protesters opposing her appointment to the presidency by parliament and demanding an election. Across Peru, violent protests are intensifying. Anti-government protesters and police taking aim at one another. The number of injured now in the hundreds and it continues to climb as relatives mourn the death of the dozens killed. <laughs> At least 47 people have died as a result of the clashes between Peruvian security forces and supporters of ousted President Pedro Castillo. The protest began last month after his removal, but the deadliest day was this week. On Monday, 17 civilians and one police officer died in a span of a few hours. Hospital morgues are filled with bodies. And now the country's top prosecutor is launching an inquiry into the sitting president, Dina Boluarte, and members of her cabinet amid allegations of what they are calling genocide, qualified homicide, and serious injuries related to the demonstrations. An inter-American commission on human rights is also looking into the police response to the protests. All of this began last December when then-President Pedro Castillo was impeached and later arrested on charges of rebellion and conspiracy while separately facing corruption charges. His vice president, Dina Boluarte, sworn in as the first female president of Peru. But then the violence came. 
President Bularte promised to move the next election up by two years, but protesters want her out now. They want a new presidential election and the disillusion of a Congress they see as corrupt before the death toll climbs even higher. Now, India's ruling Bharatiya Janata Party is hoping for a seismic shift in Jammu and Kashmir in upcoming local elections. They're counting on the addition of up to a million mostly Hindu voters to the electoral roll as a result of scrapping Kashmir's special status. For the first time in her life, Asha, a street cleaner in the Indian city of Jammu, will be allowed to cast her vote in upcoming local elections. She's got no doubts who for. She plans to reward Prime Minister Narendra Modi's ruling Bharatiya Janata Party, or BJP, which has scrapped Kashmir's decades-old special status. That denied rights to many Hindu communities not considered indigenous to the region, about a million people. Many marginalised groups will now gain full citizenship for the first time. Asha's family, originally from Punjab, was stuck in menial work, but her children are training to be teachers. We got the domicile certificate so that the children could get better education and job opportunities like the privileged ones get. Our children do not wish to sweep the street. We did this job, but our children don't want to do the same thing. Modi's Hindu Nationalist Party is counting on such votes as it pushes to take control of India's part of Kashmir. Pakistan has claimed Kashmir since the partition of India in 1947, and the neighbours have fought two wars over it. Jammu and Kashmir is divided in two. Jammu has just over a million inhabitants, about 62% of whom are Hindu. Kashmir Valley has 6.7 million, about 97% of them Muslim. For Muslims, used to being governed by Muslim chief ministers, the BJP is upending decades of autonomy and privilege to champion the rights of the Hindu majority over minority groups. See, the elections do not concern us. We do not get any benefits, even if a minister comes here. I'm happy with the way things are at the moment. I'm fine with the governor's rule. A BJP majority in Kashmir would be a seismic shift. Even talk of a strong showing underlines how Modi has trampled on old taboos to push his agenda in every corner of India. Over in the U.S. now, all eyes are on the Biden docs investigation as Attorney General Merrick Garland appointed a special counsel to take over the investigation into the Obama-era classified documents found at President Joe Biden's home and former private office. U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland on Thursday named a special counsel to investigate whether President Joe Biden improperly handled sensitive government documents. An embarrassing echo of a wider-ranging inquiry directed at his main political rival, Donald Trump. I strongly believe that the normal processes of this department can handle all investigations with integrity. But under the regulations, the extraordinary circumstances here require the appointment of a special counsel for this matter. Garland said former U.S. Attorney Robert Hur would carry out the independent investigation hours after the White House confirmed that Biden's legal team had found a second set of classified papers from his time as vice president in the garage of his Delaware home, in addition to the classified documents discovered in November at a Washington think tank. The president told reporters on Thursday that he was cooperating fully and completely with the Justice Department's review. I take classified documents and classified material seriously. The inquiry could cast a shadow over the Democratic president's expected run for re-election in 2024, and it comes as another special counsel probe is already underway, looking at former President Trump, his handling of classified documents, and efforts to overturn the 2020 election. I think Congress has to investigate this. Republican House Speaker Kevin McCarthy on Thursday accused the White House of hypocrisy. Another faux pas by the Biden administration, but treating law differently based upon your political beliefs. In Trump's case, FBI agents carried out a search last August at his Mar-a-Lago estate in Florida. About 100 documents marked as classified were among thousands of records seized. The search came after Trump resisted numerous requests and a subpoena to return the sensitive materials, leading to questions of whether Trump or his staff obstructed the investigation. Biden says he wasn't aware of the documents. His attorneys say the papers were inadvertently misplaced and were handed over as soon as they were discovered. 
But now special prosecutors, who are typically appointed to politically sensitive cases to ensure independence, will be looking into both Trump and Biden, just as the two are expected to face off again in 2024. U.S. prosecutors accuse leaders of the far-right Proud Boys group of plotting an assault on American democracy as one of the most high-profile trials to stem from the January 6, 2021 Capitol attack got underway. According to the U.S. government, the far-right Proud Boys group plotted an assault on American democracy on January 6, 2021. That was the argument federal prosecutors made to jurors in their opening statement Thursday kicking off one of the most high-profile trials to stem from the Capitol attack. Prosecutors said Proud Boys chairman Henry Enrique Tarrio and four others engaged in sedition by using force to try to keep Donald Trump in power after he lost the 2020 presidential election. If found guilty, the Proud Boys leaders could face up to 20 years in prison. All five Proud Boys defendants have pleaded not guilty, and their attorneys will argue that they did not plot to block the peaceful transfer of power. The government accuses Tario and four other group members of purchasing paramilitary gear for the attack and urging other members to descend on Washington. Prosecutors say Tario directed the attack from Baltimore and accused the four other defendants of being among the first members of the crowd to charge past the barricades that had been erected to protect the Capitol. A fifth member of the group pleaded guilty to other charges in April 2022 and could potentially be called as a witness in the case. Lisa Marie Presley, singer and the only child of Elvis and Priscilla Presley, has died at the age of 54 after suddenly being hospitalized. Her 77-year-old mother confirmed Presley's death. Musician Lisa Marie Presley has died at the age of 54, the only daughter of rock and roll legend Elvis Presley. Reports said she was hospitalized on Thursday after suffering a cardiac arrest in her Los Angeles home. Presley was last seen on the red carpet at the Golden Globe Awards just days ago, praising actor Austin Butler's portrayal of her father in the biopic Elvis. He just did such a beautiful job and his heart was so in it and he, it meant so much to him and it was such an honor for me and I respected so much what he did. So it was a mutual love and respect that truly, like, was, really came at a really nice time. Her mother, Priscilla Presley, in a statement urged for privacy as the family tried to deal with this profound loss. Lisa Presley was born in 1968 and was the owner of her father's Graceland estate in Memphis, a popular tourist attraction. She was nine years old when Elvis died at Graceland in 1977. A rock and pop singer-songwriter herself, Lisa's albums To Whom It May Concern and Now What both hit top 10 of the Billboard 200 in 2003 and 2005. She was married four times to pop star Michael Jackson, musician Danny Keough, actor Nicolas Cage, and musician producer Michael Lockwood, and is survived by three children. Her only son, Benjamin Keough, died in 2020, aged 27. Let's go for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, at the first UN Security Council of the year, calls sent out to North Korea to return to dialogue. The possibility, though, is a very low one, according to a White House source. The UN chief aimed strong words at North Korea during a Security Council meeting on Thursday as he pressed Kim Jong-un to return to dialogue. The onus is on the DPRK to comply with its international obligations and return to the negotiation table. He said the unlawful nuclear weapons program being pursued by the regime is a clear and present danger driving risks and geopolitical tensions to new heights. The U.S. ambassador to the U.N., Linda Thomas-Greenfield, criticized China and Russia, saying they're protecting and abetting Pyongyang, which grossly disregards their international obligations. China and Russia repeatedly stopped the Security Council from condemning the DPRK's unlawful actions in 2022. North Korea's mission to the UN did not respond to a request for comment on Guterres' remarks, while China's UN ambassador Jiang Zun also distanced himself from giving a response. 
Last year, China said the key to solving the issue of nuclear provocations from North Korea was in the hands of the U.S., urging Washington to show, quote, sincerity and flexibility moving forward. Meanwhile, at another event on Thursday, a White House official forecasted a grim outlook for relations with Pyongyang, deputy assistant to the U.S. president and coordinator for the Indo-Pacific, Kurt Campbell, said North Korea at this point appears to be disinterested in diplomacy, not only with the U.S., but also with South Korea and Japan. South Korean ambassador to the U.S. Cho Tae-yong also urged North Korea to engage in dialogue with no strings attached, saying the regime can still choose a future for its economic development. Now, the South Korean government has officially unveiled a plan to have the foundation for victims of forced mobilization by Imperial Japan under the Ministry of the Interior and Safety raise money to compensate Koreans who were conscripted for labor during Japan's colonial rule of Korea. The South Korean government on Thursday unveiled a plan to compensate victims of Japan's wartime forced labour. The funds will be paid through the government's own public foundation, instead of using funds from Japanese companies. The announcement has prompted a backlash from victims and their families, saying the plan would relieve Japan of its obligation to pay and apologise. The unresolved legacy of Japan's colonization from 1910 to 1945, including restitution for Koreans forced to work at Japanese firms and in military brothels, has long been a source of contention between the two countries. In 2018, South Korea's Supreme Court ordered Japanese firms to pay reparation to former forced laborers. Although 15 South Koreans have won such cases, none have yet been compensated. The South Korean Foreign Ministry's Director General for Asia Pacific Affairs, Salman Young, defended Thursday's plan at the public hearing. The government would visit the plaintiffs, victims and their families, ask whether they have an intention of receiving it, explain thoroughly and ask for full consent before making a decision. The proposals would see the Compensation Foundation funded by businesses that benefited from a 1965 treaty in which South Korea received an $800 million package from Japan. The Foundation for Victims of Forced Mobilization by Imperial Japan said it has secured initial donations from steelmaker POSCO, totaling 4 billion won. POSCO did not immediately respond to requests for comment. But Kim Young-hwan, activist and director of victim aid organization Civic Group, remained unconvinced. It's completely discharging responsibilities of Japan. I can't help but raise a serious issue. There's no other way to be compensated for their lost youth, so they are saying they want an apology. Tokyo's top spokesperson declined to comment on Seoul's compensation plan or its public hearing, saying they were domestic matters within South Korea. The rows over Japan and South Korea's wartime history have fueled concern over efforts to step up cooperation between the two key US allies to rein in North Korea's nuclear and missile threats. South Africa is experiencing an energy crisis and South African President Cyril Ramaphosa will hold talks with various ministries and other parties to find a solution to the power cuts that are hobbling the economy. South African power cuts worsened this week as struggling state utility ESCOM said it would extend its worst ever outages until further notice. The government announced on Thursday that it will take on a portion of ESCOM's debt. The utility company has been mired in financial crisis for years and is dependent on government bailouts. The National Treasury said at October's midterm budget that it could take on between one-third and two-thirds of ESCOM's over $23 billion debt to try to make the company financially viable. The Stage 6 power cuts mean six to eight hours a day without power for most South Africans and require up to 6,000 megawatts of capacity to be shed from the national grid. They are a major source of public frustration with the governing African National Congress party its support among voters is sliding. The power cuts are also a break on economic growth in Africa's most industrialized nation. ESCOM supplies the vast majority of South Africa's electricity, relying mainly on an aging fleet of coal-fired power stations that are unreliable and prone to faults. The country witnessed more than 200 days of power cuts in 2022, 
and the situation could get even worse in 2023. Since taking office in 2018, President Cyril Ramaphosa has been trying to reform debt-laden ESCOM to make it more efficient, but progress has been slow. Welcome back, and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. The United Arab Emirates said that the head of state oil giant Abu Dhabi National Oil Company would lead this year's COP28 climate summit, fueling activist worries that big industry is hijacking the global response to environmental crises. Hundreds of thousands of baby giant South American river turtles recently emerging from nesting beaches along the border of Brazil and Bolivia, an event that takes place every year. U.S. consumer prices fell for the first time in more than 2.5 years in December amid declining prices for gasoline and motor vehicles, offering hope that inflation was now a sustained downward trend through the labor market remains tight. Bosch may fully integrate Google software into its vehicles, marking a shift in strategy for the newly listed car maker that could allow drivers to use apps such as Google Maps without connecting the car to an Android phone. Sweden has discovered the continent's largest deposit of rare earth metals. The discovery of over 1 million tons of rare earth oxides was made in Corona in the far north of Sweden. And that is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again on Monday as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you missed any of the stories tonight, you can always watch the entire program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other there in English. Now we leave you tonight with the skies of India, filled with several shapes and colors as kite flyers with giant quirky kites. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.